Hello, everybody. Welcome to the History Valley Podcast with your host, Jacob Berman. Today, I am joined by Dr. David Litwa. Dr. David Litwa is a scholar of ancient Mediterranean religions with a focus on the New Testament and early Christianity. His current research question focuses on why some early Christian groups, so-called Gnostics and Marcionites, came up with the idea of an evil creator. He has recently completed a project comparing ancient angelification and diamondification in dialogue with modern post-human transformation. Before joining the Australian Catholic University, he taught at Virginia Tech, the College of William and Mary, and the University of Virginia. In 2012, he received a PhD from the Religious Studies Department at the University of Virginia. Prior to that, he received a Master of, the, of Divinity at Emory University and a Master's of Theology at Duke University. Currently, he became a member of the Steering Commun Committee of the Bible, Myth and Myth Theory Group at the Society of Biblical Literature, as well as a member of the Society of New Testament Studies. Well, thank you for joining me, Dr. Litwa. Um, I look forward- Yeah, it's to, great to be here. I look forward to asking you these questions. Um, what are, I'm gonna start us off, I wanna start us off with, what are the differences and similarities between the way other cultures in the Western world deified people? Well, that's a great question. Um, and uh, just as a, as a basic introduction, uh, I've, way back in 2013, I published uh, Becoming Divine, an Introduction to Deification in Western Culture. Deification is simply put the the idea or notion that human beings or it's human destiny to sort of evolve or to graduate into a higher uh, platform or a, into a higher life form. Sometimes it's evolutionary. Sometimes it's sudden. It's quite quite a diverse idea idea, and it's also global. It's everywhere, including China, and. Um, Far Eastern, other Far Eastern countries. So I covered the, the Western culture in which I include Islam. Um, one of the ironies of deification is it is fairly muted in the Protestant uh, tradition, but it's, it's quite central in the Eastern Orthodox and Russian Orthodox tradition. So this is basically, deification is basically a synonym for for the, the salvation at the highest level. So your, your human destiny is to become a, a deity, which sounds odd because Westerners are, are very familiar with this term that's thrown around, which is monotheism. And what, what those, especially in the Protestant tradition, don't quite realize is that it's very much built into the Christian traditions in the East, that God, that the divinity isn't a zero sum game, as it were. So it, it's not like there's a, there's a single God who is excluding everybody else. The, the idea of deification in the Abrahamic traditions is that God is by nature good, which means generous, which means he is like a son which is beaming out vast amounts of divine energy, just like our sun. And people who are in tune with the divine can share in that energy. And it's not a zero sum game, it multiplies. So God is a, as a fullness, a pleroma is the Greek. And he, he just sort of radiates divinity. And those with the sort of radio signals that are turned on, get to participate in that, in that divinity. Now, that being said, as a general concept, depending on who you ask, deification does, in fact, mean very, very different things. And so I've, I cover different conceptions of it in about uh, 15 chapters of the book Becoming Divine. And I start, you could start many places, but I start in ancient Egypt. And that's where many people think that this idea emerged, at least in the West, where the pharaohs are identified with a deity, particularly Horus, as is very well known today. And it's during their coronation that they receive divine names. 
and that they are invested with a huge amount of divine energy and that they effectively, they never lose their humanity, but effectively as they are Pharaoh, the office of Pharaoh is a deifying office. So whoever occupies that office is a God on earth. And that's really, that's really what they, they thought. It, it wasn't just some sort of political ploy. Uh, I mean, it, it, it was in some respects uh, a way for pharaohs to gain power, of course, but it's also a religious belief where your ruler is a, is a god as well, at least in terms of his function as pharaoh. Your ruler, you know, going to the bathroom and taking a piss is not a god, but your ruler sitting on the throne and giving off decrees, uh, you know, is a god. So uh, it's sort of like uh, the Pope speaking ex cathedra. The Pope is just a human being. Nobody believes he's a god, but speaking ex cathedra, he is, that is, in his capacity as office holder of the Pope, he is the vicar of Christ, and therefore his words are carry that sacrosanct uh, value. So that's the sort of idea there. And you see this in the ruler cults uh, later that develop in Greece and in Rome. Uh, the Greeks and Romans basically take over this idea. And uh, then you've got it in Christianity. You've got it in Islam. You originally had it in Judaism. One of the very first people who was deified is Enoch. Um, but also Moses was deified, uh, I think anyway, by Philo of Alexandria, if some of your viewers are familiar with him. And in a, in a document called the Testament of Orpheus, these are, these are Jewish documents, which clearly portray Moses as a divine being. Also in a text called, uh, are written by a fellow by the name of Ezekiel, called Ezekiel the Tragedian, depicts Moses as occupying the throne of God as a divine figure. So this idea is familiar in the Abrahamic traditions, and I take it up all the way through Augustine, uh, Martin Luther, and into uh, modern Mormon thought. And if I can, as a, as, a, as a sidelight here, Jacob, I have um, in my PowerPoint, I go into one particular figure and I'm wondering if I can just share my screen to sort of give an in-depth case study of- Sure, absolutely. Of, of deification, okay. All right, let me give this a, a try here. Um, Let's see here. Oh, let's see. Are you seeing are you seeing a change there? For some reason it says host disabled participant yeah, screen. That, here, here we go. I, that, I fixed it. Okay, yeah. Let me try that again. I wish that setting would just stay on. That uh, that I mean disabled, <laughs> I mean, because I have to keep changing it, reminding <laughs> oh, enable it for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Uh, so I think we're good now. So this yeah. is the book, uh, just uh, so your viewers know it. Uh, it's an introduction to deification in Western culture. And uh, just to give you a, a, a case study of deification, which, which I, I attempted to craft in answer to your questions, Jacob, that you sent, I want yeah. to look at uh, the phenomenon of Greco-Roman ruler cults, and one figure in particular, who is not a Roman emperor, but is someone who sort of is the proto-Roman emperor, and that is uh, Mark Mark Antony. I'm going to fly through this first screen and just look at just look at Mark Antony. So in 39 BCE. Athenians, the Athenians, people of Athens, meet Antony outside of their city, and Antony issues coins in the city with his, his bust, that is his, his head, crowned with ivy, which is the distinctive sign of Dionysus. Athenians betroth their goddess Athena to Antony, which is quite humorous because Athena is, um, <laughs> is a virgin goddess. <laughs> but anyway, right. And a surviving inscription refers to Antony as the new Dionysus, or Neos Dionysus, these inscriptions uh, are, are actually uh, fairly frequent. Um, so Antony 
is very consciously, as he's coming into Greek cities, portraying himself as a particular deity. He's not just a, he's not just a god in general. When the Greeks sort of try to incorporate Roman power, they, they don't start from scratch. They start from what they know. And what they knew was Dionysus. And they recognized something in Antony as particularly Dionysian. And, and this became the official political rhetoric. This, was, this isn't just like a fun story. This is their, the official political line. So Antony is the Neus Dionysus. He is actually married to the state goddess. A source called uh, uh, Athenaeus, uh, who's uh, early second century probably, tells us that Antony had a, a hut built in, in a very conspicuous place in the theater of Dionysus. If any of your viewers have been to Athens, this theater survives. So on the top of this, this theater, which is right below the Acropolis, he's got this very fancy hut, but he's covered it with this green brushwood and this is in representation of a Bacchic cave that is a Dionysian cave, which is an entrance to the underworld. So he's very consciously portraying himself again as Dionysian. And in this, he, he hangs all this Dionysian paraphernalia. So he's got fawn skins and drums and uh, Bacchic wands or sometimes called Thirsi. And he gives orders that from that point on, this is again, 39, 38 BCE. So you know, a full generation before Jesus is born, he gives orders from then on that he is to be proclaimed as Dionysus or the new Dionysus throughout all the cities. And this is, this is an official, you know, he's, he's a Roman political ruler, but he is he's officially presenting himself as a sort of new version of a very old uh, Greek god. We learn more from Plutarch who writes the life of Antony and he says that when Antony shifted over to Ephesus, which is in, in uh, Western Turkey, he says that women were let out dressed as bacchants and men and boys as satyrs and pans, that is just like these goat-legged uh, figures. And the city was decorated with ivy and there were Dionysian wands and harps and pipes and flutes. And it was this wondrous parade bringing Antony into the city. And people were shouting out in the streets that Antony was Dionysus give of joy, Dionysus the gentle. This is what the people were, were screaming, sort of like if you can imagine, I hate to use this analogy, but it's sort of a little bit like a Trump rally, except they are deifying their ruler, <laughs> using the, calling him specifically Dionysus and Di the Dionysus that they know and love, the giver of, of joy. In 34 BC, he continues this line. He triumphs over Armenia, which was an easy, easy win for him, uh, in the streets of Alexandria, where he, again, very consciously, wreathes his head with ivy and dresses in a gold embroidered gown. He has a thyrsus stick, which is a, a, a stick with a pine cone on the end of it, which is, which is something Dionysus carries. And he, he wears high-laced boots like those of a tragic actor. Again, Dionysus is not only the god of wine, he's the god of acting and theater. So again, this is, <laughs> this is a you know, very, very conscious move. And so when we have all these traditions and we gather them, we have to ask, what in the world is going on here? What does the actual common person believe? Because we see this in particular ritual context where, where a Roman ruler is parading into a city or parading inside a city. And he's giving orders that he's the new Dionysus and he's dressing like Dionysus and he's encouraging other people to address him as Dionysus. What does all this mean? I mean, this, is, this isn't just made up, this is real history. So on one level, assimilation to a deity was very much a, a political power play. Obviously a ruler gains power and, and accreditation by uh, assuming the, the role of a traditional Greek deity. So that's definitely true. But on another level, the divine energies of a god could inhabit a person, and Dionysus as a god could inhabit many bodies to display his own power. And this is a general belief about gods in antiquity. They are able to inhabit many 
bodies. They have a sort of a fluid type of a body and they are able to energize. Much like the Christians think of, of the Holy Spirit. It, the Holy Spirit can, is a divine entity, but he can enter into many bodies, inhabit them, make them do things, whether it's ethical actions or speaking in tongues or whatnot. And then the Holy Spirit can leave, uh, or in this case, Dionysus can leave, and he's back just being Antony. And that seems to be, and as far as my research has, has taken me, that seems to be something that many people actually were prepared to believe about, about Antony. And this is quite striking because, you know, I know many of your viewers are, think very seriously about parallels between Dionysius and Jesus. Yeah. And the reality is these parallels were a generation before Jesus and even before that were very consciously developed by this particular Roman ruler. And so this would have been absolutely familiar. And this is the political context broadly, the, that is the Mediterranean and the Greco-Roman world. This is the political context in which Jesus inhabits. Of course, he's in his particular subculture where gods and rulers usually don't, don't mix. That's not a good thing for Judaism. But occasionally, you do see overlap even in Judaism. There's a famous case in the Book of Acts where Herod Agrippa dresses up in this silver robe, goes into the theater, and is, uh, is, is, is addressed as a deity by the people in the theater because the, the sun is sort of glinting off this robe, and he's, he's, he's being addressed as a divine being. And then the author of Acts is careful to say that he immediately dies and is eaten by worms because he doesn't like that. But this is the political context of hmm. the Greco-Roman world. You do have rulers assimilating to particular deities. Now, there's a bit more to my presentation, but I want to stop and, and let, you, can, let you sort of um, ask uh, or, or make any developments you want at this point. Sure. Um a question that I've been thinking about as you were talking about Moses being portrayed as a as a god in the sub Jewish apocryphal literature, um, and by Philo, of course. Um, does this indicate to you that there is a presence of, to an extent, Jewish polytheism being practiced by the uh, adherents to the Jewish apocrypha, like for Enoch when it says Enoch? who became Metatron is the lesser Yahweh? Yeah, uh, I, I get the question and it's a good one. The thing is religious insiders like Jews, Christians, and uh, especially Muslims are never going to accept the, the reality or, or the, I shouldn't say reality. They're never going to accept the label of polytheism because for them that's, something bad. But what, what's interesting about Philo, who is, is you know, left and right, always emphasizing the uniqueness of deity, who that he calls the, the high God, the existent, the absolute. Um, and no one comes even close to him. But at the same time, he portrays Moses as transforming into noose, that is into mind and into mental energy, essentially. And having all these divine powers to do miracles and uh, whatnot, and also being called a God. And, and Philo is just reading Exodus seven, verse one, where Moses is called a God to Pharaoh, right? right in the Hebrew text. <laughs> so so it, he's not, in, in a sense, he's not innovating, but he's recognizing that however far high God is, the existent, that other pe people can participate in those energies because our labels of monotheism and polytheism sort of get in the way of this general conceptuality. The general conceptuality is that deity is a, is a reality that can be shared. And because it can be shared, other people can participate in it. But still at the end of the day, Philo is gonna say, 
No, no, I, I believe in one God, even though he's calling Moses a God. And that's, so this is, this is something, this is something distinctive to religious outsiders. Now as, or insiders, sorry. You know, if you're a religious outsider and you don't believe any of this, well, you might want to say, well, you know, you're just a polytheist in wanting to convince yourself that you're not a polytheist. Hmm. But I think the goal of scholarship is really to understand religion from the inside out and how understanding how someone who's like a rabid promoter of a single deity can also call other human beings God and remain in some level of, of logical consistency, this is the, this is the task of scholarship to, to, to describe how that happens. Because obviously Philo is, if Philo's Moses is essentially a preparatory exercise for the Christian Jesus, because Christians have that same weird trait where they are insisting that God is one. They are insisting that, that they are monotheists and yet they have a Trinitarian conception of God, and yet Jesus is clearly part of the Godhead, who is a human being, who on one level remains a human being, who is a creature, and is worshipped full on. So this is, this is the, the, the challenge to describe how is this reasonable and logical, and honestly, I, I, don't, have, I don't have the best answer for you, but this is what's going on. Does the deification of the historical Jesus as the son of God remind you of the deification of the pharaohs of Egypt, the kings of Greece, and the empire and the emperors of Rome, whom were also understood to be the son of a god? And I like to add to that question with um, this other question: What were the circumstances historically that you think may have caused the historical Jesus to be deified as the son of God? Well, this is again a, a really excellent question and something that probably could fill several hours and many, many, many books. But I've I've explored this in my book called Jesus Deus as to why early Christians deified Jesus in their literature, because it's it's clear that this individual, for me anyway, was a historical human being from Nazareth and, and who was a, a peasant and seemingly nothing special crucified in a in gruesome and disgusting way, and yet now worshipped as a god by some 2.3 billion people. So how do you get from how do you get from A to B there? That's quite that's quite a, a difficult question. What I can say is generally what's important to recognize is that just as we were talking about Antony, Jesus is born in a context in which other people are deified. And probably the most well-known people who are deified are Greek and Roman rulers, people like Alexander the Great, people like uh, Caesar, Julius Caesar, people like Caesar Augustus, who, and, and, and several Roman emperors, even during Jesus' uh, lifetime. Jesus was a boy of 14 when Caesar Augustus was deified by the Roman state. So they know that this is going on, they're familiar with it. It's like making headlines and they know that this is happening. So as an idea, it's, it's, it's infused in, in the culture. And then I, for me, the next question is, well, why is it logical for Romans, or Greeks and Romans or other Hellenized peoples to, to think of their rulers as a deity? And is there any overlap for, for Christians. And what I try to show in, in Jesus Deus is that, yeah, there actually is a fair amount of overlap in terms of the thought process, because there was widespread agreement on what a God was in, in the, in the Greco-Roman world. And a God was simply a, a being of superhuman power who had experienced no death or corruption in their inner self, their body might have perished, but their inner self, what the Romans called the, the genius, didn't perish, but rose, ascended on some level to a heavenly location. And there existed as, as part of the, the general collective of divine beings. And for, in the case of, 
of Jesus. The Christians modified some of this, but they carry over some of the basic structural ideas. They also carry over the idea of benefaction, and benefaction is this fundamental idea that you recognize someone's deity by the fact that they do tremendously good and wonderful things. And this is where miracles come in. And when, when you think of miracles, the doers of miracles in the ancient world were, were in many cases uh, Roman rulers who could heal people and there's stories of them healing people. So a being who manifests immortality, a being who produces benefits, radical benefits, through miracle and other super, acts of superhuman power is widely and generally, and actually quite logically considered to be a God when you are thinking of the Greco-Roman concept of God. And this is long before Platonism sort of gains dominance and the God is defined as a as you know, you got all the omnis, the omni, you know, omnipotent and uh, omnibenevolent and omniscient, uh, and, and a, a spirit being without a body and having ultimate power and omnipresent. We're 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 not there yet. A god, if you 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 get the best understanding of a god if you go to a Greco-Roman Roman museum and you see how they depicted gods as real living people with real human bodies, just a lot bigger, more beautiful, and, and uh, usually gods are a lot more intelligent also. They, that wisdom is a very common characteristic of a god. So if you have someone who's displaying superhuman power, superhuman ability to escape corruption, such as rising from the dead, and also a superhuman power to benefit others, and you throw into the mix a superhuman wisdom, ability to predict things. Well, it isn't out of the range of, of, of rationality to say that this, this person is a god. And I, I know that I, probably many of your viewers today look back on that and say, well, that's, that, may, that actually sounds rather silly. But for someone with a different concept of god, that actually on some level was a rational act. And there are people today who even living and breathing right now who claim to be God, um, including it's probably safe to say uh, <laughs> the ruler of North Korea. And why do people believe that he's a God? Well, for some of the somewhat analogous reasons that we, we've talked about here, that he's supposedly a giver of benefits and he supposedly has a special divine spirit or and he supposedly has uh, you know, superpowers or something of that nature. So I, it's just important to keep in mind that for, for a Greek, a god looks sort of more like a modern superhero than he does a platonic uh, like super god, like Philo's existent. What do you think gave the Mormons the idea that God was once a man like us? And doesn't it contradict the idea of God as being the first being to ever exist if he was once one and once a man himself? I ask this because I know you read about the Mormons in your book. Um, and you, you kind of talked about that. And what you were saying earlier at the beginning of the interview is people, people like Moses or this guy or that guy, just people getting deified, human beings being deified into a God or being made pretty close to the level of Yahweh, uh, the Abrahamic God. Um, and then the Mormons, it's not just that, you were also bringing up another point, which I thought was important. You were bringing up that the whole point is to live this life is to become a God. And in Mormonism, they teach that when you die, you go to this paradise where you live as a God, everybody's a God. Yep. Yep. That's, yeah, that's a great question. And I, I it's, it's a very exciting one for me personally. <laughs> hmm. It's me very enthusiastic and I'll just share what I have here uh, in the PowerPoint and, and tr to try to explore, to come close to answering that, that question. 
uh, because I, I think Joseph Smith in the Mormon tradition uh, in general, uh, they didn't, not everything that Joseph Smith said was, has, has now become, you know, staple Mormon doctrine or tradition, but uh, I think that Joseph Smith and Mormonism in general have in some ways renewed the discourse of, of deification, and it's a quite a surprising renewal for me because generally they come out of a sort of Protestant spirituality, a Protestant tradition uh, uh, that they take in their own new direction. And whereas Protestantism generally has this allergic reaction to deification, uh, they, they all get worried about it and, and up in arms when you, you know, tell them that the, your salvation is really becoming a god. <laughs> they don't like that at all. But interestingly, Joseph Smith was able to integrate a very fascinating view of deification that had real points of contact with discourses that were being spoken hundreds, if not thousands of years before him. And this I find a really fascinating fact. So there's something called the King Follett Sermon or, or Discourse, uh, which uh, Joseph Smith gave uh, not, not too long before he was killed. And in this sermon, he proclaimed to thousands of people of, of his followers that God himself was once a man and that after beginning spiritual children, he populated an, an earth, this earth, uh, that, he, that he made um, along with you know, his son. And, uh, and that's how essentially we, we got here. We are, we are spirit children, uncreated spirit children uh, that is not created out of nothing, but begotten as, as well, as children are begotten normally. Um, and this is a this is a fascinating idea for me because there is something in antiquity that they thought very seriously about, and that is the idea that God or the ultimate God was a human uh, with a sort of a, a, a capital H, um, and specifically there was a group of Christians called. Ophites who speculated that there was a primal deity called man who gave birth to the son of man, who is, of course, familiar from the Gospels, and that there was also a primal woman who was identified with the, the Holy Spirit. And we see this theology, it's a Christian theology, it's a form of Trinitarianism that was developed by early Christians uh, that obviously didn't, <clears throat> didn't survive. But we can see it, test, it testified by Irenaeus in his book Against Heresies, chapter one, or book one, chapter 30, and in a Nagamani text called Eugnostus. And these I, I highly recommend to your, to your viewers. Um, the idea of a God human or, or of the ultimate God being a human goes back to Genesis where God creates a human in his image. And by deduction, God is, if he's creating in his image, then, then God must be the paradigm or the model for human beings, right? Because that's obviously, if we're the image, then he's the paradigm. So, and if God, if God is creating male and female, then God must have a male and female aspect at the very least or there must be a male and a female God, and this can be taken in, in various directions. But, but this is the basic idea that, that humans are, a, from, from the Hebrew concept uh, this, from Genesis, humans are a projection of God, and, and they, are, they are born of God, and that God is their father. And so God is human himself and is the, the model, the sort of type A human with a capital H who generates other humans who, who are in some ways uh, uh, lesser than he is, obviously. Um, 
But, but if you look at Genesis 2 and, or Genesis 3 and you, you find God walking in the garden, well, you intuit that he has legs. And uh, you find him speaking and reasoning. And uh, in Ezekiel, you find him sitting on a throne, the famous vision of Ezekiel 1, where he's got a bottom half and he's got a top half. And there's a rainbow on top of him. But he's clearly a man and he's sitting on a throne. <laughs> and he's, he, is in a, he is, in a sense, a, just a larger, more powerful version uh, and, and a deathless version of, of the human being. And this is, this is Yahweh. So again, this is prior to the Platonic Revolution where Christians and Jews later on uh, in, in the Middle Ages basically transformed their concept of God from the God human to a Platonic concept of God where God doesn't have any shape, he doesn't have any form, he doesn't have any body. He's really a spirit, and, and, and that's all he is, and he's omniscient, and he's omnipresent. We're, we're, we're hundreds of years before that. But what's interesting is Joseph Smith, who, who wasn't that well-educated, but was obviously very smart, he goes back to this Hebrew concept of God, and he basically rejects the Platonic heritage and recognizes what I think is fairly prevalent in the Hebrew Bible, that God really is human. And so it's no surprise that the Christians actually do worship a human being. Now they say that God became human, right? But the real mystery is God always was human anyway, because that's built into the concept of God. And if we're made in his image, then he's the model. If you wanna learn more about this, I actually have an article about this. It's called The God, Human and Human Gods. Uh, it's in a, a, a journal, Zeitrifianticus Christentum, or the Journal of Ancient Christianity, and uh, so, so I think you can find that uh, online. Um, but, but getting back to Joseph Smith, what I, again, in, in this King Follett discourse, or sermon, is that he, he seems to add what to us and to many is this very polytheistic idea that, as you said, every man and woman have the ability to gradually evolve into, into Godhead. And, and later, you know, there was some, some theological development on this that, you know, you had to be married and, uh, and, and, and to, to populate, to create more spirit children. And then in an afterlife scenario to make worlds, basically, and to uh, release your seed, your spirit children into these new worlds. And so the universe is, is sort of like this God-making machine where we're all, all of us, all billions of us are become, on the way to becoming gods. And we're making billions and billions of other worlds filled with other humans who are destined also to become gods. I mean, it's, it's quite a large scale striking vision of, of reality. And it, it's, it's amazing to me how big Joseph Smith was thinking. Now, some of this you know, continued on in Mormon tradition, and some of this didn't. I, I would probably think that many Mormons today would, would not accept the, the doctrine of, of the King Follett sermon, but some would, uh, and uh, I, it, it's, it's still a very significant historical uh, artifact, and, and it has, it, it really has a, a big impact, because now you've got post-humanism, you've got uh, organizations like Humanity Plus, uh, who are saying that you know, humans do have the ability to evolve into higher platforms. We do have the ability to become immoral, whether that's uploading our consciousness uh, onto a supercomputer and living forever in a silicon body or something, something like that, uh, or somehow being able to reverse the aging process and you know, restoring our telomeres and making sure that we don't age, and and gain you know, living for hundreds of years rather than just seventy-five or eighty, and and that for many people, I mean, this this really isn't science fiction anymore. They really think that this kind of thing is is in the horizon, and and so in some ways, I, I think that uh, Joseph Smith, whatever you think of him. 
was uh, touching on some really interesting, interesting things, and he was he was bringing back uh, into discourse some of the basic ideas that that were were part of the ancient reading of, of the Bible. So um, this other thing that that um, I've been curious about is is that in Mormonism they they view um, Elohim as God, but they identify Yahweh with Jesus. So Yahweh as Jesus is the son, is actually the son of God. And that kind of reminds me of Israel, what it was uh, supposed to have been like before Judaism. And they, they viewed Yahweh as the son of El, the supreme Canaanite God. And, um, and, the, and their Gnostic and Marcionite traditions um, Yahweh or Yaldabaoth was he's an evil god and he's a son of El or the Monad um, it seems to be a different version of El and Jesus is the son of a higher god the Monad the friendlier merciful god um, suppose uh, uh, that's, that's how Marcion seems to have viewed it, uh, viewed it and so did the Gnostics do you think that seems to tie in with the what the Mormons think to a point, they don't have quite have the same views, but it's, it's somewhat similar. So it... Yeah, there's a pattern of what I would call Phoenician, or if you prefer Canaanite theology, where you can all go all the way back to the what's called the Baal cycle. Mm -hmm. And this, these, these were ancient tablets, which are, are very, very ancient, um, going back to 14th century BC, so mm. 1400, 1500 years before Jesus. And in this, we have a, a basic theology where, yes, there's a primal deity, El, and he has a son called Baal, and, and El just means God, and Baal just means Lord. And, and you realize that, well, that's sort of how Jews also referred to their deity. I mean, they sort of, sort of switch between God and Lord, and that's, that's, that goes way back. But it's a father-son relationship. The father also has a, it's a primal female deity who's, who's married to El. Uh, she's variously named. Um, and uh, this, this primal goddess figure and this divine family is a triad. It's a father, it's a mother, and it's a son. And this Phoenician theology is still a living theology in Jesus' day. It's still a living theology in when the, the Christian, so-called Christian Gnostics uh, are, are kicking around right in the second century. Uh, so right in that area of Tyre and Sidon, if, if you're familiar, your, your viewers are familiar basically with, with what is today ancient Lebanon, that's where Phoenician theology starts um, and has an existence. Uh, it's, a, it's a living Greco-Roman religion. And Jews are, in a sense, part of this larger family of Near Eastern Semitic peoples. So they are siblings to the, the Phoenicians, um, something in the Hebrew Bible that they sort of wanted to forget, but they are definitely mm. siblings uh, of, of the Phoenicians. And they definitely called their God, Lord. Uh, and they definitely call God, God. They, they just use the Phoenician terms, El. Uh, and they have their own term, Elohim, which is just the plural. Uh, and, and there you go. Uh, it, so, so some have speculated that, well, essentially the Hebrew modification in that Phoenician theology is to say, well, we don't like God the mother anymore. So she sort of gradually disappears by, say, the 5th century BCE. Uh, uh, and, but God the Son, he never really disappears from the Hebrew Bible. If you, if you look at Daniel 7, the famous vision of the Son of Man, that's basically Baal. And the Son of Man approaches the Ancient of Days, which is this big dude with a beard sitting on a throne. That's El. So in the vision, and, 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 and the book of Daniel is quite late, okay? So that's like 160, 60-ish BCE. So this is quite late, just, you know, uh, 150 years before Jesus. But there you go. You've got a father deity, El, and you've got a son deity. They don't call him Baal anymore, but uh, he's, the, he's the son of man. 
Why is he the son of man? Well, because God is a man. <laughs> mm. So, so it, it makes perfect sense that, uh, that there's a son of man. Now, he's also a god. So man is a god. Son of man is a god. And uh, the mother has disappeared. But, you know, she is also, there's also the Hebrew wisdom figure who is the sort of the, of the feminine divine as well. So these, these elements of Phoenician theology were never forgotten. And they also, yeah, they tend to crop up in, in other areas. So you have a triad of a father, mother, son, deity in the Apocryphon of John, or an Insethian theology in general. Um, and, and the Apocryphon or Secret Book of John is, is, is a, in Nagamati, if your readers are familiar with that, or your, your viewers. And uh, so, yes, and Joseph Smith, who is a, who is a fairly careful reader of the Hebrew Bible, at some point he, he tried to learn Hebrew uh, from a, a, a Jew, um, and, and he picks up on some of this stuff, and, and he's able to sort of bring it back into uh, uh, Protestant theology. Uh, and he, he basically skips over the Platonic phase of, of Christianity, and, and tries to bring us back to the to the Phoenicians, uh, and is, is is pretty successful when you think about it. So the son of man is basically because like Baal, as you know, is attacked heavily in the Old Testament as a false god. He's a god of those Canaanites, so there he, he sucks. Um, you're always bigger than him in so many ways. Um, so it's. So he turns into the son of man. And do you think any of the Jews were aware that he was a son of man? Well, I mean, in a general sense in which everyone was generally familiar with the pattern of, of Phoenician theology, where you had a, a primal father deity, usually fairly odios, meaning he didn't do much. But then the son deity, Baal, was the real sort of player. You know, he was the one for whom epics were written, and he fought Moat, the, the god of death, and he came out of Moat's mouth, and he was resurrected, and, and so on and so forth, that they were familiar with them being in humanoid form. And that's exactly how they're depicted in Phoenician iconography. I mean, they're not depicted as intellectual, as, as blobs or fun guy. They're depicted as human beings. They're just larger and, and, and if you go over to Greek and Roman iconography, they have that very same characteristic. How do you depict a, a Greco-Roman deity? Well, he's, they're, they're larger. They're humanoid, obviously, but they're larger. They're more beautiful. They have perfect proportions. And, and that's who they are. They are. But they are human. They, I mean, they are more human than we are human. And, and that's the sort of that's the sort of mystery. It, 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 it's a, it's a certain it's a certain element of of the Jewish and maybe even the Christian tradition that they would prefer to forget. But but that is definitely uh, you know more and more being I, I think clearly recognized in, in scholarship. The Gospels often portray Jesus as being not only in conflict with the Roman authorities but also with the Jewish authorities. And his followers don't seem to be, at least as portrayed in the Gospels, they're not really to our orthodox. And based on all of that, on top of the fact that he was deified, obviously, um, did his followers, in, in, in your opinion, did, did they, do you think they probably were followers of um, apocryphal ideologies like the the idea that Moses was deified or other Jewish figures were deified outside of Torah orthodoxy? Well, it's a great question. And here's another good example where modern terminology just gets in the way of good history because this term apocryphal just comes right out of Christian apologetics, right? Apocryphal mm -hmm. is just those those books or ideas which weren't accepted. <laughs> uh, but it, it absolutely means nothing in the ancient world because uh, Philo, who deifies Moses, uh, and, and, and the writer of the, of the Testament of Moses, the writer of uh, the Ascension of Isaiah, the writer of the Testament of Orpheus, all these works that 
uh, you know, weren't canonized, well, the canon didn't really exist during Philo's time. So Philo wouldn't say that, oh, I'm going to deliver to you an, an apocryphal idea. I mean, he wouldn't think of it as an apocryphal idea. He, he would just think of it as the truth. Right. <laughs> and, and later on, hundreds of years later, you know, Christians and Jews got around to divvying up what was canonical and what was apocryphal. Uh, and, and so now in terms of our, our categories, we're, we're stuck with these uh, and we have to really fight hard to imagine a world in which, in which there weren't these value judgments. But essentially, you know, the, the, if we imagine Jesus's first rank of disciples as, as men from Galilee, uh, obviously, everyone in the in the Greco-Roman world is generally familiar with deification in the Roman ruler cult. There's no there's no way you couldn't be familiar with that. It's sort of like a modern person would be familiar with the golden arches of McDonald's. I mean, you really have to strive hard not to know what those are. Um, so it's ubiquitous. It's everywhere. They are generally familiar with it. Now, it's not part of their it's not part of their native Jewish subculture, but they're definitely familiar with the idea of a human being becoming a god. And when you really understand Hebrew theology, right, that God is the ultimate human, right? We're made in his image, so he's the model human. So becoming divine and becoming human are really, and I, you know, this sounds uh, almost mystical, but they, they're really two ways of saying the same thing in, in the Hebrew tradition. And, and the idea of deification really isn't that radical if you recognize the radical humanness of, of the Hebrew deity. Uh, and, and so, you know, all this, the, this reaction that you get from Orthodox, modern Orthodox Jews and from most Christians, mostly in the Protestant tradition is, you know, they, they get up in arms like, how dare you say that you know, a person can become a god, or that, or that, that that's mm. uh, that's you know, that's just satanic. Well, <laughs> when, when you're really familiar with, and you really approach this with an open mind, I think you, you see that this is not such a hurdle for these people. And if you really thought about that, we're already made in the image of God, and the point of life is to become more like the model. Well, deification is really built into the very core of of Jewish and, 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 and Christian ideology. Um, so I, I, you know, and, and obviously we're, we're probably gonna get some pushback in the comments, but I, I really think that that is the case. Hmm. You brought up the ascension of Isaiah and uh, uh, there's a lot of people on my channel um, there's a lot of people that the many people that follow my channel are they they accept the mainstream view that there was a historical Jesus. Then there's a bunch of them that that don't, and they follow the mythicist view that there wasn't one. There was no historical Jesus. Um, what I was curious about is the Ascension of Isaiah um, seems to be this very strange text that portrays Jesus differently to a point, very differently to a point. It, it, it contains a virgin birth story in there. And he says, okay, yeah, Joseph and Mary are his parents on earth. Um, does it claim that, that the virgin birth narrative in there is a later interpolation and that the original text represents a very early Christian idea that there was no historical Jesus and this whole thing happened in heaven? Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I actually, I have a chapter on this very topic hmm. in um, my book, How the Gospels Became History. Uh, it's a brief discussion. Uh, the, the chapter is more general than that. But I, I talk about Richard Carrier's view um, of the ascension of Isaiah. And I, I think one, my general word of advice to your your viewers is to be very cautious about a theory that needs to depend on interpolation in order to work. Interpolation is simply the idea that a passage was later inserted into a text. And so essentially some mythicists uh, want to use the ascension of Isaiah as evidence, but they're bothered by this one particular passage 
uh, and it's been it's been a while since I've looked at this myself, but I, I believe uh, it's it's in the latter half of the Ascension of Isaiah around chapter eleven, and they're they're bothered by this, and so they're so bothered by it because it seems to describe just Jesus as a human being. Um, they're so bothered by it that they say that it's that it wasn't there originally, and so. When you want to make this kind of argument, I mean, it sounds like an, ar an argument from convenience, right? It's sort of like, well, we don't want it to be there, so we'll say that it wasn't originally. Hmm. Right? Now, in order to make this argument work, you need very careful evidence. That is, you need to go back into the manuscripts and to see if in the oldest manuscripts this passage was missing. Because without that, it's just a guessing game, right? I, I mean, and, and, you know, we have to, if we're going to be good scholars, we have to at least be responsible enough to say, I've got evidence for my view. And this happens in 1 Corinthians 14, where, where we think there's an interpolation about women being, being uh, silent in the churches. And, and when you look at the manuscripts of 1 Corinthians 14, this this passage moves around in the manuscripts, which indicates that someone put it, inserted it at one point, and then right. someone inserted it at another point. And so we know that the passage was movable because that's what the ancient manuscripts say. But when we go to the Ascension of Isaiah and we see, is this little bit, does this little bit ever disappear or does it pop up in different places in, in the book? No, no, it doesn't. So. I, I just, I, I, you have to go back to the evidence. What's the evidence that this is an interpolation? Is it just because it's inconvenient for your theory? If that's the case, sorry. I mean, this, this no longer supports your theory. And, and if we're gonna be honest, I, I think we need to pursue that. I think the, the ascension of Isaiah is, is not a supporting link for the mythicist theory. And they, they have other supports, uh, but this one is not going to help. When does, the, when does the Ascension of Isaiah date? So, well, you're, you're really testing my knowledge here because mm -hmm. it's been a couple of years since I've really researched this. But so the Ascension of Isaiah is, is in two parts. Um, the first part is the martyrdom of Isaiah. And the second part is the vision of Isaiah. And we think that these both originated at different times and that a later author fused them together. That, uh, but that's an educated guess. Okay, we have, we have no manuscript evidence of them circulating separately. But we think, that, we think that there were probably two different traditions that were combined by an author. And that combination occurred probably in the early second century. So uh, anywhere between about 100 and say 130-ish. Again, this is only a rough estimation. And uh, the, the vision of Isaiah is where most people like to focus on because that's the, the, the sort of the juicy part. Where the Christian about. elements. Well, yes, you've got more and more Christian elements, definitely. Mm -hmm. And you've also got, you know, to, to see the mysteries of, of, of the seven heavens and what's going on in each heaven. And you get to see Jesus, uh, what, where Jesus is. And you've also got this fun story about his descent and the fact that he des descends from the seventh heaven in a disguised fashion because he doesn't want the, the demons. And the demons are, interestingly, they're not in the underworld, right? That's not how they how, hmm. how they thought they, they're in the upper world, right? Because demons are just bad angels, right? So he, he has to descend through the demonic layers, which are the lower level layers of heaven. And he doesn't want people to know that he's descending because he's sort of like an enemy. Uh, he's sort of like a general who wants to disguise himself <laughs> and come down on earth uh, in, in disguise. And he doesn't want the enemy to know that he's that he's sort of in their enemy camp, you know. So that's that's the that's a fascinating story, and 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 then yeah. So the 
I mean, you could you could use that story in any number of ways. Uh, I think the author of the Ascension of Isaiah really believed that that's that's how Jesus descended and was born as a baby. Um, that he fooled the lower rulers because you know that's just good military strategy, you know. Um, mm. And and but but the mythicists who who are, aren't really interested too much in the in the ancient conceptuality are more interested in saying that. Well, this story must mean that uh, you know all the, the events of Jesus' life happened in heaven. Um, but that I, I've never seen that in 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 the text. Again, that that part which which annoys them about him being born <laughs> as a of a virgin um, and 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 going through his his lifetime, which is just a summary, but it's there that. Uh, that they don't like. The way that it portrays Jesus as going through heaven like this, um, would you agree that seems to be, as you brought it up, you brought the ascension of Isaiah, like when you, when you first brought it up earlier, you used the, uh, the text as an example of Jesus becoming divine. Does this show Jesus as being viewed in, as almost like a second God, a second heavenly power? Definitely, yeah. He's he's definitely a, a second, a secondary deity, um, and he, he's definitely like uh, again he's fulfilling the the ball role uh, in in Phoenician in Phoenician theology. He's the son of the high deity, and the high deity sends his son on a mission to Earth to defeat the demonic enemies and then to rise back again in, in this big parade of, of glory. The deification element, so from the perspective of the ascension of the author of the ascension of Isaiah, I think the author of the ascension of Isaiah, if he were here, he would say, no, no, Jesus wasn't deified because he was always a God. So he goes down hmm. and he disguises himself as a human being, and then he goes up. And his, his so the only deification that is going on as he's going back up is he's he's revealed as what he always was, a deity. And his, the, the human bit was just a disguise. So there you go. But what's interesting about the Ascension of Isaiah, for me anyway, is how the, the saints, that is human beings like Elijah and Adam, and, and are, are depicted in the seventh heaven, because they all are super angelic beings. And they're even better than the angels. And if, if you're better than the angels, then what are you but a god? As far as I'm concerned, others will have different views on that. And uh, I've, I've talked uh, in my books and writings, um, in my recent book from Cambridge called Post-Human Transformation, I've talked mm. about angelification as a form of deification. But of course, some will, some will disagree because uh, not everyone views angels as, as gods. But whatever they are, they are superhuman beings. And human beings do become them and sometimes become better than them ontologically and that's what we see i think in the ascension of isaiah philo of alexandria expresses god in an interesting way uh he he says that the uh, god manifested uh the, the logos or the word manifested in the flesh it sounds like john chapter one and he's um in the, in the, in the way philo writes about this um, seems to indicate that he thinks that the flesh of God on earth is the physical manifestation, is the word of God. And he seems to portray him almost as if he were a separate entity in this way, almost like a dualism. But in the end, the body is God anyway, because he's, um, his, the body is inhabited by God. Does that seem to influence John's conceptual view of Jesus? Well, this this is obviously a very popular question of Philo's logos and and John's logos. Um, my impression is that Philo is very very different than John. So John has. Uh, you know, the Logos Sarks again at all. The Logos became flesh or became hmm. a, a bit of flesh. Uh, or he appeared in flesh, depending on how you want to translate that. Uh, Philo has this very famous 
saying in his, his book called Embassy to Gaius. And Philo is very anti-incarnational because he says, mm. sooner would man become God than God become man. And he, he, just, he just refuses to believe in any kind of incarnational understanding of God. Which is interesting because if you turn to other areas of his work, he seems to allow Moses to share the divine energies and to become an intellectual power, a noose, as he put it, or a mind or a consciousness, again, depending on how you translate it. But I, I, would, I think it's safe to say that Philo is still, he, he would be against the idea that God in terms of the existence or any high God, including the Logos, and the Logos is just the chief of God's powers, would become human. I think he's basically against that idea. Um, so in terms of the incarnational bit, there's not really a precedent in Philo. You can, humans can share the divine energies, but God is, the Logos is not going to become human. So this is what Christians tend to boast about, right? Because on the one hand, you've got the precedent of the Logos in Philo. You've also got it in Heraclitus and other Greek and Roman philosophers talk about the Logos. But nobody ever talks about this incarnational concept of the Logos until you get to John. And uh, on one level, that's true. But on another level, if you look at uh, Stoics, I would say if you want a parallel to the, to the incarnational understanding, you're, you're better served by the Stoics than Philo. Because the Stoics have the universal logos, and that is the reason of the universe manifesting itself in all aspects of the universe. So in a sense for the Stoics, on a large scale level, the logos is, is understood incarnationally. That is, you know, the trees are a manifestation of divine reason, and they are because they are, they're part of nature, and the Logos permeates all of nature. And so for them, yeah, things like trees and clouds and rivers and all of nature itself is a manifestation of the Logos. And so that is incarnational on the grand scale, but for Christians, uh, they obviously reduce it to one single individual. But at the same time, they sort of open the back door and say, well, yes, there's a special manifestation of the Logos, but he makes possible the deification of all other human beings. Final, uh, final question. Um, does, the, does the New Testament, because the way, the way that um, the Gospels has Jesus talking about the Son of Man, almost like they're two different beings, but in other places, it seems to suggest Jesus was the son of man. Was it like a title being tossed around between two different characters? Well, I think, I think generally Jews of Jesus' time would have been familiar with Daniel's vision of the son mm -hmm. of man, which we've already mentioned. So Jesus' reference to, to the son of man would have reminded them, sort of sparked their imagination and brought them back to Daniel. And that figure of the Son of Man who's riding on the clouds, who is different from the high God, the Ancient of Days, who's sitting on the throne, that's definitely a, a, a person in the Jewish cultural encyclopedia. He is, and, and that person, that, that Son of Man riding on the clouds is not obviously Jesus. So yes, there is this ambiguity in the Gospels where Jesus is referring to the Son of Man. And sometimes you get the sense that he's referring to himself. Sometimes you get the sense that he's referring to somebody else. And I think it's quite a deliberate ambiguity. And at one point in the Gospels, I believe in John, people just finally just blurt out and say, who is the Son of Man? Would you just be clear, please? Mm. Uh, and it's a little bit like a Life of Brian moment. You know, where we're finally, you know, the audience is like, Come on, would you quit talking in this ambiguous way? I mean, just give us something straight for once. And and so there is you'll you'll never be able to fully resolve the the ambiguity. But I I think for Christians and for for people of the Christian faith, 
they are more and more inclined to take every reference to the Son of Man as Jesus because they simply see the vision in Daniel as a prefiguration of Jesus. They, they, they simply see him as fulfilling the ball role. Hmm. Uh, he's the Son of God. To so, so I mean, you can make a big difference between the Son of Man and Son of God, but it, in the end, in terms of the structure of theology, those are really referring to the same being, uh, the Son of, because God is human. He's the Ancient of Days sitting on a throne, and he looks like a man because he is a man, and he's the model of man. So if you want to refer to the Son of God, that's fine, but he's also the Son of Man, <laughs> and that's the big mystery. Well, thank you for joining me, Dr. Uh, David Litwall. Um, in the future, oh, I would you. like I would like to have you return, uh, if you would, uh, to talk about your other books. Absolutely, like, uh, especially the book, um, um, the book that you mentioned earlier that you um, in which you mentioned the Ascension of Isaiah. Um, I would like to expand. How the Gospels became history. Yep. Yeah, I would like to expand on that at some point down the line. And um, great. I'll leave the links to his uh, Amazon page, website, everything in the description so you guys can go buy these books. Um, highly recommend them. They're uh, a great read. Hello, viewers. Thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron. And or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during a live stream. Thank you.